Thank you. Um, perhaps the title should better sound is not only about the wall, it's about the freedom. Um, and first of all, I have to say thank you for organizing this very important event, inviting me to participate. But I particularly want to thank every one of you who's still here tonight at 9 o'clock on Friday, 7 o'clock on Friday evening, instead of being somewhere in the nice Berlin. Uh, but still you are here uh, to listen to this speech. And I, th I don't have the presentation, but I thought this illustration is actually very telling. Uh, about where Europe is um, 30 years after the fall of Berlin Wall, even though I received this a couple of years ago, so it's not, it's not very 2019. However, I think it, it's very telling. And when thinking about this event and my speech, I really tried to remember as what it was like back in 1989. I think for many of you that can remember those days, um, you probably know where you were when you heard the story about the fall of Berlin War, or even before when people started crossing the borders in other parts of Europe, uh, or were watching it on TV. And I remember it very vividly, being a high school graduate in um, a small town in north of Croatia, very close to Hungarian border. Um, we all watched to, uh, in wonder and amazement in the former Yugoslavia too, uh, trying to comprehend what is to follow and what those events actually mean, what the future will be like. However, I think it was evident even then that it was not only about the wall, um, the wall that separated two countries. It was also the celebration of freedom of individuals. Breaking the walls built either by bricks or by metaphors is at the same time breaking of boundaries that put limitations on our choices, thoughts, dreams, and beliefs. That is what people have fought for throughout the history. Freedom is the soul of humanity, as Mr. Lech Walesa described it as being very important uh, person at the time. It is an essential part of what makes us human, and no wall can forever separate us from the aspiration to be free. This celebration is also the time in which we honor the people of East Germany and other East Europeans who did not run out of hope after having been isolated and repressed for 28 years. Most of them probably had hard time remembering what the life was like um, before uh, 1961 as this was the only life they ever knew uh, for those that were born after. All that changed on November 9, 1989, when freedom became reality for millions of East Germans, and the new hope was born in the rest of Europe, even the rest of the world, that in spite of nuclear war being a threat for decades, peace actually might just get a chance. And I think that was also very important realization. Berlin Wall was built as a tool of oppression in order to keep the people within the borders, and not just physically. The wall was there not only to discontinue movement of people, but also their minds, information, ideas, thoughts, and desires. It was an extreme way of creating a closed society, the one in which progress was strictly controlled and a possibility for a woman or a man to freely create a future they want for themselves very limited. The wall separated Berliners from their friends, their families, their jobs. Years have passed by. A man has even made steps on the moon. But the only ground East Germans could walk on was one under communist rule. There was no place for the rule of law, for freedom of press or of movement, for freedom of expression or assembly. For almost 30 years, the wall was an everyday reminder that people are not the masters of their lives, that they have no choice but to stay there and live the life someone else decided they should live. However, as we have seen for so many times in history, desire for freedom can be suppressed only for a while, not forever. In 1989, it was clear that repression was not to be tolerated anymore, as people of Hungary, Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and other countries raised their voices and demanded a change. Europe was in turmoil these days, and the hope that a democracy a new democracy can be achieved was at their fingertips. 
To many, however, it is not widely known that the opening of the borders in Germany did not actually start with breaking of the Berlin Wall, but with rising pressure of the civil rights movement. In Leipzig, it started as a gathering in the famous Nikolai Kirche, but soon evolved into an unstoppable river of thousands of protesters who took streets chanting, we are the people, calling for freedom. It was exactly one month before the fall of the Berlin Wall. 70,000 people showed up and marched with candle in their hands and freedom in their minds. They did it with enormous courage, knowing that they are risking so much as they knew what happened in Tiananmen Square in Beijing, where the protests ended in blood. But the wish to be free was finally so much stronger than the fear. And the rest is history. The peaceful protests in Leipzig turned out to be an unbearable pressure for the government of East Germany, and it led to the fall of Berlin Wall. Simply talking about the East and West Berliners joining hands, falling to one another and crying from happiness can hardly leave anyone emotionless, even today. So hearing the whole story, it tends to sound so simple. But we have to remember that for all of the days, the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain was there. It was not only the concrete or the wire that kept the people of East Germany, Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and other countries oppressed and silent. It was the fear. So today, we must recognize the significance, the moving strength of courage and bravery of all those East Germans, Hungarians, Poles, and others who mobilized themselves, organized in Solidarnost, or used the picnic as an excuse to go across the border, who demanded change. We must applaud the bravery of all those men and women, young and old, who courageously stepped out and broke walls and boundaries in geography, in politics, in, so in, um, in sociology, in society, who stood against regime and its secret police demanding for more freedom and did it peacefully. It was a peaceful movement that knocked out a violent regime. So this occasion, it's a celebration of freedom, unity, and peace. Today, more years have passed after the fall of Berlin Wall than it actually stood here and divided Germany and Europe. Our continent, or more precisely, what is to become the European Union, in that time evolved from being divided by a concrete wall to become a world leader in promoting freedom, democracy, rule of law, equality, and human rights. And these are just not some theoretical concepts, but true guarantees of our well-being that we must uphold, preserve, and continue to fight for. However, nowadays, instead of these values shining bright like never before, they are often neglected by political elites in order to achieve short-term political or other gains. Democratic values, freedom, rule of law, respect for human rights should not be seasonal decoration a part of a nice speech, like the one we heard actually this morning by a Slovenian president, used only when it's popular and comfortable. They should not be misused or even sacrificed for short-term and easy solutions for most complicated challenges in society. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. This is the first article of the Universal Declaration of the United Nations that was drafted 71 years ago. It reminds us of the obligation, obligation we have towards new and future generations so that the atrocities of the Second World War that sparked its drafters would never happen again. Never again, we need to remind ourselves over and over, as it is only fair to wonder if, I, if our societies live up to those words nowadays. Would a universal declaration be drafted in 2019. I doubt it. I say this as a human rights defender, as an ombudswoman that has a promotion and protection of human rights as a part of my constitutional mandate in Croatia. Challenge before us in 2019 in Europe is how to truly reflect these values in our everyday lives, especially now in the times of widespread populism and attempts aiming at regression of human rights and freedoms in Europe. Today, once again, Europe is facing a shrinking of the democratic space, not as strong as one under communist rule or other repressive regimes, but still worrisome. There are indeed increasing challenges in relation to rule of law 
undermining of democratic space and the backlash against human rights defenders and those who advocate for them. During the last few years, we have seen restrictions on free media and even the assassinations of prominent journalists in the European Union member states, attacks on independent judiciaries and human rights defenders, attempts aiming at reducing women and reproductive rights, laws limiting the financing of NGOs and criminalizing support to migrants, widespread hate speech, particularly online. In many European societies, there is strong political and public support for the us versus them dichotomy, them being the others, most often belonging to different minority and vulnerable groups, such as Roma, LGBTIQ, or other, who still face increasing prejudice, stigma, and discrimination. This is all happening in EU member states as we speak. Particularly vulner vulnerable, however, are migrants those in irregular situations, asylum seekers or refugees. Those people that in 2019 wish to cross the border, break the wall, to live in freedom. If we look back at 2015, so just a couple of years ago, we could see that Europe was a champion of solidarity and one picture particularly comes to my mind, which is um, of villagers in Eastern Croatia, very close to the border, who took out the tables from their homes on the street and offered simple meals like jam and bread and hot soup and tea to the refugees that were passing by. They were not afraid of those strangers and anger towards them. The media was full of such examples of the basic principles of solidarity. And later on, at some point, European politicians decided that that kind of solidarity is not sustainable anymore. At the same time, failing to agree on managing of unprecedented migration in the way that would be sustainable, and at the same time respectful towards human rights, and that would guarantee basic human rights safeguards to all people, as recognized in international and European law by, for example, providing sufficient legal pathways in order to put human dignity once again at the forefront of the decision making. The reasons for current migration are complex and multifold. Some people left their countries and walked to another continent because of conflict and war. Some because of political instability, because of corruption or deficiencies in the rule of law some in fear of repression and persecution, some because of more and more extreme weather conditions. Many simply wanted a chance to live a brighter future, employment opportunities, health services, better education for their children. Is that so difficult to understand and empathize with? The wish for a better future and the lack of legal ways to reach it. Today, in Berlin, does that sound familiar? In what way are the needs and wishes of those migrants coming to Europe nowadays different from ones East Germans, Hungarians, and Poles had 30 years ago? In 1989, the world celebrated their freedom, the tearing down of the wall, and today it seems to be so afraid of those who seek the same. So once again, this illustration may be very telling about this situation. Because today, instead of building bridges, we are building walls, again, across Europe and EU. And not just metaphorical, but the real walls. They may not be built of bricks, even though some are. They're built out of wired fence. It was very interesting for me to listen to Mr. Pachor's speech this morning, describing the situation on the border between Slovenia and Italy. Why I, well, I have to say that even as we speak, a wired fence is still there and probably being built new kilometers between two EU member states, Slovenia and Croatia, and also Slovenia, uh, uh, Hungary and Croatia. So it's not metaphorical. You may not be aware of it. You may not see it on the news daily, but even real walls are being built, not just those that are in our minds. So must, we must not look the other way. 
We must speak up and fight against those tendencies. We must not keep quiet, but stand up and be loud, courageous, just as East Europeans were 30 years ago, together, to prevent all types of new walls from being built around us. We need the same courage and strength that led the way for thousands of Leipzig protesters 30 years ago, as freedom should not, must not be taken for granted. And it is always and will be something we have to take care of every day and demand it in the name of those less fortunate, wherever they live, whatever the color of their skin is, or which God they worship, whoever they may love, whatever they may be running from. Finally, this celebration is undoubtedly a tradition we should never lose because it is a great opportunity to remind ourselves, especially young people, how easy it is for a movement or an idea to become a sad and shameful part of our history and how important it is to fight against it, to be alert, strong and courageous, united and loud. There has never been and probably never will be a time where we can be sure that it will not happen again. It happened. Therefore, it can happen again. I'm sure we've all heard about this saying. To keep the memory alive, we must insist on systematic education and awareness raising, especially on the rights and duties that we all carry as citizens since the youngest age. In that, there is a role for all of us as citizens, as duty bearers. We all have a role to play in building bridges, in building open and inclusive societies from top to bottom or bottom up, international and regional organizations, governments and parliaments, independent human rights institutions and equality bodies, academia, non-governmental organizations, trade unions, media, religious communities, and other. Because only working together and in dialogue, we can find democratic and sustainable solutions for some of the most pressing human rights challenges. Only informed, aware, empowered people as individuals can be enabled to build open, inclusive, and peaceful societies in which we can all thrive and be our best. So let's use this day and the memory of its significance to reaffirm our commitment to these values. Because the history has taught us so many times, silence simply should not be an option. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like very much your speech and uh, your emphasis on the claim for freedom and respect for fundamental rights at the basis of what happened 30 years ago in Berlin. And it was extremely interesting, your analysis uh, related to what's happening uh, nowadays in uh, various European countries that shows in certain respects some regressions with respect to the to the ideals <coughs> and the principles that were uh, established and revendicated 30 years uh, uh, ago. You um, put your emphasis also on the question of the rule of law. The po problem is that I I many times governments, they tend to say, well, people voted for us. They wanted certain legislation to protect us uh, the border, security, and uh, defense against the foreigners, especially in the context of, uh, of migration. But they tend to forget that you cannot invoke the status of your legislation to violate international norms. They want to have both ways, want to have national legislations in place that goes against international commitments, but they don't want to go away or withdraw from international commitments. This is a very strange and worrisome situation. Now, uh, what do you think international institutions can do? The United Nations, the treaty bodies, the European Union and, and the institutions of European Union to try to reverse. Are they putting enough energy in trying to contrast this tendency? Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments and, and questions. Um, I think the answer to growing populism, one of the answers to growing populism, um, and the, the easy answer that you mentioned, they voted for us, is proper, sustainable, very early, um, lifelong education. 
um, education not only through the school system, but also through media, which is particularly challenging today with the social media and everything that it, it brings about. Um, also, my recent experience, and I might be a bit pessimistic these days more than usually, because I realized in a clash between politics and law, politics wins and law loses. In relation specifically to your question, what can United Nations and treaty bodies do? What can European Union do? There is a difference between them because uh, European Union is a political concept. United Nations are more legally based. We speak about the international human rights norms and its implementation. And of course, as you mentioned, um, national legislation must comply with the international. Um, unfortunately, sometimes in some situation that doesn't seem to be important anymore because for the political priorities that supersede the international obligations, the current management of migration is reflection of the European Union uh, policy or lack of policy, lack of solidarity. It is the best way European Union has thought of in outsourcing the uh, sea uh, patrol on, in the Mediterranean or the situation in Greece, and I, colleague is, I know colleague is here and can say much more about it. Pushbacks are notorious. They are happening all over the external border of the EU, even though they are against international convention on the status of refugees, which, by the way, obviously did not live up to the challenge of the situation that we have at our hands. Security of the border and security of the people that live within the territory of any state is important for all of us, I'm sure. But we can have proper, true security only if human rights of everyone within the jurisdiction is respected, regardless of migration status. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. It was wonderful, um, very insightful as well. Um, I'm a student from ICD. Um, I have a question regarding illegal immigration. Uh, what is your take on it um, and how can the EU combat this situation with regards to illegal immigration? Thank you. Thank you. First, about the terminology. There are no illegal migrants. People cannot be illegal. It's what we do or don't do that's illegal. So uh, the, the human rights uh, aligned terminology would be migrants in irregular situations. Um, those are the people that go most often undocumented, trying to cross the borders through the sea or green border or where they can. Um, if they have a chance to seek for the asylum, we call them asylum seekers. If they receive international protection, then we call them refugees. Um, my take is what I briefly tried to, to explain in the speech. Um, and as for the solutions, if I had any, I'd probably be awarded a Nobel Peace Prize next year. <laughs> there are no easy solutions. But if we look for them, we need to make sure that they are deeply anchored in human okay. rights, uh, international and national and European legal norms and standards. <laughs> 